Okay, so problem sets are up front, uh, but I'm going to get started and you can pick them up afterwards. So, um, today I'm going to talk about regulatory solutions to the monopoly distortions that we talked about uh, in the last class. Uh, I'll talk about why average cost pricing is such a common solution. Uh, in particular, why marginal cost pricing is in many ways a hopeless ideal and how average cost pricing is often a workable alternative. Um, we'll also talk about some reasons that average cost pricing arises in uh, situations even when uh, firms aren't regulated. I'll then talk about distortions away from average cost pricing. Uh, sorry, distortions that average cost pricing can cause, in particular the classic static distortion in the case of economies of scale. Oh, shoot. Um, I'll then talk about dynamic distortions that can result from regulation. Uh, I'll talk about applications to in, uh, selection markets, in particular insurance markets, uh, and how that relates to cost curves, uh, measuring uh, the collapse of markets, and uh, how that relates to recent interventions in health insurance policy. Okay. So let's turn to uh, the solutions to natural monopoly. We talked about natural monopoly and what might cause it last lecture. And um, the, uh, I'm going to focus on the case when there's sub-additivity over at least some range of costs. The simplest solution is just to mandate pricing at marginal cost. However, when there's economies of scale, and uh, even when there's not economies of scale throughout the full range, usually uh, average cost will be below, um, sorry, will be above marginal cost. And therefore, mandating prices to be equal to uh, marginal cost will require firms pricing below their average cost and therefore they'll require subsidies in order to op uh, operate. And this follows almost directly from the existence of economies of scale. Now, it's not completely immediate because you could be pricing on the increasing part, let me see if I have a picture of this. You could be pricing on the increasing part of the average cost curve where marginal cost is higher. So for example, imagine that we have a U-shaped average cost curve and the demand cuts over here. So we probably have marginal costs, maybe you've got some fixed costs, and then you've got marginal costs going like that. In this case, the marginal cost will actually be higher than the average cost, but still it would be a natural monopoly because if you had two firms, they would be less efficient than this one firm. But generally, you're going to have uh, marginal costs that are below uh, average cost, and therefore if you mandate marginal cost pricing, the firm will be taking losses and you'll have to give a subsidy. Um, and this requires not just a regulator, right? A regulator can force down prices, but it requires a government that can raise tax revenue from the public in order to fund the thing, right? Um, and this could come from income taxes, sales taxes. Uh, uh, we'll talk a little bit about this in the lecture on redistribution. Um, and in that case, you'd sort of operate the firm as a public monopoly. Uh, because it's getting subsidies from the government, there's not really much difference at that point from having the firm actually being publicly run. So what are some examples of cases where either the firm is publicly run or it's subsidized so that it can operate at marginal cost prices? Uh, Connie, what, what are some examples uh, like that in practice? Yeah, that's a great example. The post office is subsidized by the government so that it can provide services at very low prices. This is also true of much public transportation is subsidized so that they can charge you closer to marginal rather than average cost prices. 
Uh, m many government services are like this, like the DMV and so forth. What is the DMV? Uh, D Department of Motor Vehicles. Okay. The people who license your cars. Okay. I was wondering, does yeah, public education come like public schools? Is that, or is that? Yeah, so public schools are subsidized down to a low price. I think they're probably subsidized even below marginal cost prices, though, because you get them for free. Yeah. Uh, and there's almost certainly some marginal cost of having a student in the class. Um, okay, now all of these solutions, however, require a lot of information. So to have marginal cost regulation, you need to know the whole cost curve, right? Because you need to not only uh, regulate down cost, but you also have to determine the amount of the subsidy. Um, and raising inframarginal costs doesn't even raise the price. So imagine the firm just like does something really wasteful that creates more costs, but doesn't increase marginal costs. Then that firm won't even reduce the price and therefore won't even reduce like the subsidy that he's, he's getting. So um, that can be a, a big problem because it gives the firm really no incentive at all to economize on its costs. Pigouvian subsidies are another possibility uh, that would solve the problem entirely. But this requires knowing a fair bit about demand you don't need to know the whole curve, but you do need to know its slope to know what the size of the marginal uh, uh, surplus is so that you can subsidize that amount, because that's the distortion the monopoly will introduce. Another possibility that could perfectly solve the problem would be perfect price discrimination, but this would require the firm knowing everyone's willingness to pay. Um, and a final thing that you could do if you could implement perfect price discrimination, you'd still need to extract from the firm all of the rents that it was earning, because otherwise the firm would earn a ton of profits. And this would require several competitors knowing the value that you could be earned by uh, being in the market. So, um, and perhaps the worst problem with marginal cost pricing is that you wouldn't know under marginal cost pricing whether it was worth the market existing at all because you would be regulating things down to marginal cost prices, right? And you wouldn't know whether if consumers had to pay the average cost, they would still, it would still be worth it to them for the firm to exist at all. Uh, and so you might end up creating services which take a subsidy, um, are, uh, you know, charge a really low price, and uh, consumers might not be willing to pay the amount that's required to support the service in the first place. So that, those services are sometimes called white elephants because they're like just created, they get all these subsidies, but they might not be worth uh, existing in the first place. So this, these are all major problems with marginal cost pricing. Tova, do you have a question? Yeah, can you explain the Pigouvian subsidies and why? So imagine that you wanted to subsidize the firm to get them to charge marginal cost prices. You'd have to give them a subsidy that's equal to the amount that they're losing uh, when they charge, uh, reduce their quantity. And the amount that they lose is equal to the slope of the demand curve times the quantity that they're currently selling, right? And so you'd have to subsidize them that amount. And the question is, you know, how, how, how do you figure out what the slope of the demand curve is? I mean, you can't, I mean, can't you please give you, I mean, I, isn't like finding a slope of the demand curve like really straightforward? I mean, well, I mean, you have to force the firm to experiment with prices and, you know, see what happens then. I mean, you can, you could try, and in fact, that's what most regulatory boards, you know, spend their time doing. But there might be, you know, firm might know a lot more about that and have lots of ways to screw around with however you're trying to learn it. Um, so, like, for example, you know, we do all these demand estimation things in I.O., right? And we rely on these publicly available data. But think about all the endogeneity problems that a firm could cause for you if they wanted to. So like imagine you're using some instrument. Well, that's based on something being exogenous. But if they know you're using that instrument, then they could go and exactly when that thing happens, screw around with their, their prices in order to make the demand look flatter or less flat if that was what you were going to give them a subsidy based on. So in fact, I actually think that like there's a fundamental flaw in a lot of demand estimation that's used for antitrust policy. Because if it is not actually being used for policy, then who cares? And if it's actually being used for policy, then you need to think about how the firms would screw around with your empirical strategy in order to figure that out. And you see what I mean? So, so is that, that, I mean, right now, most of the firms 
most, uh, the government for most markets is using Bogovian subsidies? Well, no, they're not using exactly Bogovian subsidies. They're using like antitrust policies that de rely on demand estimation. Okay. But the, that all the data for those demand estimation come from firms. And so like either we're just doing something in the abstract and it's having no effect on policy, but that's, you know, then it's not worth doing at all. Or if it's having some impact on policy, then you should think about how firms are going to respond to that. In a lot of the same way that we talked about with the VCG, you know, mechanism and the contingent valuation surveys. Oh, so it comes like agricultural products yeah. subsidized now by the government? But those are subsidized for totally different reasons that have nothing to do with um, monopoly power. Those are just subsidized because the government wants to give subsidies to the corn producers. So, oh. yeah. So like subways would be an example of CTA would be an example. Something that's run close to marginal cost pricing, yeah. But, but way below average cost pricing. It takes losses and it gets subsidized by the government, city government. Okay, so another problem can be um, capture or corruption. So regulation can quickly become a means of corruption. Regulators can get cozy with the regulated and they can be easy to control. And consumers can be diffuse. Uh, that is, like, they don't have concentrated interest in keeping the prices down, whereas the regulated firms have a concentrated interest in keeping them up. And there's some evidence that this partially happens. Now, organized consumer groups can help balance this. And usually when you have utilities, you have an organized group of consumers that are in charge of like monitoring the utilities, public interest groups uh, that do that. And, but this happens most when things are very opaque. The harder the information is for the public to acquire and understand what's going on, the easier it is for the regulators to get captured. And so in some sense, um, this is really just another version of the information problem. Uh, Moonsu, could you explain that? You said this is another version of the information problem. So like we said, that you know, the biggest problem with information, with regulation, is information, right? And you know the problem of regulatory capture, I want to argue, is really also a problem of information. In what sense do you think that's true? Um, I say that if the if it was an efficient market where information was like known for everyone, I guess the as you just said, the, the room for corruption is less. What? Why is that? Because. If there's um, room for room to crop, I guess. There, there are others who might want to take that advantage as well. Yeah, so I mean, I think that the biggest reason is just that, like, so the biggest anti-corruption group in the world is called Transparency International. Because in one sense, all that corruption is is a lack of transparency. Because if what you're doing is making, you know, uh, like increasing the wages of the public servant, and as long as that's transparently done, right? That's, that's fine, right? That's not corruption, right? So more generally, all these things, they thrive on the lack of transparency, right? With transparency, it's very easy to correct these problems of regulatory capture. So really, in some sense, the information uh, problem is the fundamental problem in all these situations, even in the regulatory capture. It's just a lack of information by the public who monitors the regulators. Yeah. Like, are there always um, like means, even if there's transparency? Like we know that the like we know that there's let's say we know there's uh, poor spending in the government sometimes, but we don't really have the means to address that. Well, I mean, usually when there's poor spending in the government, democracy is a sufficient means to address it, or even shaming. I mean, usually but these places. I mean, do we see it working? No. I mean, in, in in most developed countries, I think so. I think if it's if like there's transparency on corrupt practices, they almost always get weeded out. In fact, sometimes even too overzealously. I mean, like, people do even the little slip up and everything goes crazy. Like, I don't know if you remember the case with Obama and the IRS uh, going after uh, Tea Party groups. Yeah. I mean, that was like, they were just using it as a way to search and they were doing similar things for the Democrats, but still, there was even a slight whiff of impropriety and everything went crazy. So it's really the lack of transparency, I think, that's the source of most of these corruption opportunities. I mean, kind of the way that our government works now was with, like, it was kind of spending, I mean, in, like, contracting, like, private contracts, and, like, yep. I mean, they're transparent. They're just, like, incredibly complicated, and, like, no one really... Well, that's not transparent. 
I mean, I mean that's I, I like to you, me. To I, me, there's no difference between asymmetry of information and asymmetry of understanding. I mean, if if like you can dump a huge number of documents on somebody, and like in principle you could figure out from those documents what you want to know, but in practice it would take you hundreds of years to do so. That's not any. That's not transparency. So you know. Like, um, bridge to nowhere. I mean, <coughs> this is really old stuff, but that's not. Is that just because the documents are too complex for the to go through? Well, I think that in that case, uh, I mean, that did cause a huge uproar. But that's like an example, right? That's not like. Well, I mean, it it sort of went through, but a lot of these things only go through because they were like rushed through at the last minute and people couldn't really see them. So in some sense, that's a temporal lack of transparency. You know, or, uh, yeah, Luke. I mean, or as Brackman, like you said, dumping 100,000 pages on someone that can't read it all. Like, if you look at the bills, like, for funding, yeah. they're yeah. stacks. Yeah, so there's a, I don't know if anyone's ever read David Foster Wallace's The Pale King, but it's a book about the IRS. And what he says is, like, the way that the IRS achieves secrecy is through complete transparency. Because the IRS basically is just so boring that nobody, like, like you know, like, uh, uh, like the National Security Agency tries to keep everything secret and it leaks out because people are so excited to learn about it. The IRS, like, does everything bad that it does in complete plain view. It's just that nobody, like, wants to go through the billions of pages of documents about technical tax matters that they... Uh, and then David Foster Wallace also has a, a transparency problem. Oh, I don't think so. I like David Foster Wallace. I think he's great. But anyways. Is there um, also like a, a way to partially address the problem? Like in the, actually, it was that the first problem said, like to give, if, like, if I don't know as a consumer what efficiency means, yeah. can as a regulator to do something more simple than... Exactly. Efficient. Yeah, so I think a huge thing in regulation is coming up with like a very clear mission, mm -hmm. which makes it easier for people to like tell what's going on and create some... I think that's like an absolute key for regulation, as I like tried to make clear in that problem set. That's also a way to cope with like asymmetry of information. Yeah, yeah. If you create a clear ideolo ideological mission, that makes it much easier to. Yeah. Okay. So to address some of these concerns, the m it's more common to use average costs, and this is called rate of return regulation or cost plus regulation, in which the profits made by a utility are capped at some low rate that's supposed to correspond to a. a reasonable return on capital investment. Um, and a simple model of this, a static model, is just that you cap price at average cost. Um, now, Winnie, what are some of the benefits that average cost pricing has over marginal cost pricing? Um, it's easier to, to figure out how much the average cost is. Yeah, I think that's probably the most important one. Yeah, I think that's probably the most important one. It also doesn't require external subsidies, right? Um, and that helps politically and with you know other issues. It's easier to measure average costs. You only need to know the average cost at one point, right? And if consumers buy the good at that price, then you know that it's worth creating the good, right? Because you know that the demand is enough to cover the uh, average cost, so you're never going to create wasteful white elephants that way, right? So as a result, average cost pricing can lessen the informational problems associated with regulation. And I think that's one of the most important reasons that it's used so frequently. Now, Ayatova? Sorry, do we think of like the postal service as an example of a white elephant or? Possibly. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I guess it depends on your interpretation. The problem with white elephants is precisely that you can't know for sure whether they're white elephants or not. But it, I think there's certainly an argument that it is. Uh, so, um, is Albert here? Oh, hey, Albert. Um, could you give me some example of rate of return or cost plus regulations in practice? Um, maybe. Well, cost plus regulation is something that you can do. Well, no, but they charge marginal cost prices, so they're actually subsidized from outside. Um, yeah, so a lot of electric utilities are still currently or used to be uh, regulated by average costs. Um, so power, water, heat utilities, they're usually called utilities because there's a, they're a public utility. They're a private firm that's monitored and regulated by a public utility board. And these are supposed to be overseen by consumer advocates. 
public transit and some infrastructure are on average cost basis rather than uh, marginal cost. Sometimes they take subsidies, but sometimes they're forced to recover their costs, and so they charge higher prices to do that. Um, telecommunications, until the mid-80s, there were national regulations on AT&T to force it to earn only a certain rate of return. Um, and in fact, local calling was subsidized by um, higher uh, rates on long distance calling. And AT&T was broken up in the 1980s and forced to give access to local carriers uh, in order to create competition rather than monopoly. But all those guys have merged back together and as you probably know, there's only a few telephone Tele telecom carriers now, so a lot of people think we're back at the monopoly stage without the regulation. So that's a that's a problem. Um, and more broadly, you know, there are cases where um, uh, you can bring lawsuits against firms for excessive or abusive pricing, and that's not um, actually regulation, but in some sense you're trying to say, oh, they're making too much profits, so you're trying to get a sense of their average cost and to keep them down to that. So effectively, that's an implicit form of average cost regulation. But average cost pricing can ar arise not just from regulation, but also from free entry. Um, because if anyone can enter freely into an industry, uh, because there are a large number of equally able managers who have you know, equal access to capital, and the you know, entry is in a ro rocket science, as we discussed uh, when we were talking about uh, free entry, um, Profits then will attract new entrants to the industry until prices get driven down to a zero profit equilibrium resulting in average cost pricing. And this can arise from equilibrium even without regulation and is a very common assumption in many economic models. Now it may not be that realistic because of heterogeneity as we talked about before, but it's often a useful benchmark way of looking at things. And so in many cases competition will in some sense mimic average cost pricing. But average cost is, of course, not equal to marginal cost. And therefore, average cost pricing is not efficient. Um, and when marginal cost pricing is below average cost pricing, and therefore marginal cost leads to losses, then average cost will always be above marginal cost. And thus, average cost pricing will always lead to a higher price and a lower quantity than does uh, marginal cost pricing. So average cost pricing, therefore, downward distorts quantity in a similar way to the way that monopoly distorts it downward. But it turns out that it's not as extreme. The wedge now is going to be the difference between average cost and marginal cost rather than that between price and marginal revenue. Um, and the size of the distortion is going to be proportional to average cost minus marginal cost. Now remember, average cost minus marginal cost is the same as the slope of the average cost curve, the negative of that multiplied by quantity. So this is proportional to the size of the market plus the slope of the average cost curve. Um, but remember from this graph that it is possible to have a natural monopoly even when the marginal cost is greater than the average cost, in which case average cost pricing would actually lead to too much production. So let me show you these standard cases. So here's a simple case where you have declining average cost and declining marginal cost. So marginal cost is below the average cost. The social optimum would be where marginal cost is equal to demand, but the equilibrium is, sorry, the average cost pricing leads to demand equal to average cost, which leads to a Harberger triangle of distortion between the marginal cost price uh, and the average cost price. Um, so this is the most classic distortion associated with uh, average cost pricing, but there's some other distortions that are possible as well. So one is that average cost pricing could lead a market that would be socially valuable to exist to not come into existence in the first place. Can someone explain why that's the case? Uh, yeah, Russell. Uh, average cost is below the demand curve, then price and average cost. If the average cost is below the demand curve? Uh, above the demand curve. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. yeah. It's an end. No one's going to be willing to pay that much. But, but could it still be worth creating the market in the first place? Uh, that could just be a white elephant, right? Uh, yeah, so it is possible 
that the marginal cost is everywhere below demand, but that the average cost is everywhere above. So let me show you a picture of that. Um, so in this case, the average cost curve is a, always above the demand curve, but the marginal cost is always below it. What really matters is not the demand curve, but the average utility curve. So the average utility curve is the same relationship to the demand curve that the, uh, that the um, average cost curve has to the marginal cost curve. So the average utility will be flatter. And even though demand is down here, the average utility curve might be higher. OK. Um, so yeah, the average utility is the like gross consumer surplus divided by the quantity. Um, and uh, when there are, uh, now you can just think about things using the marginal cost and the demand curve if there are no fixed costs. But imagine that you have fixed costs, then the average cost will, the marginal cost won't be enough to tell you. You'll have to think about whether there's a point where the average utility is beyond the uh, uh, average cost curve. So in this case, at low quantities, it wouldn't be worth the market existing. But at larger quantities, it would be the worth the market existing, because then the average utility is above the, um, the average cost curve. OK. So average cost, in this case, we say that average cost pricing can cause what's called a death spiral or market collapse. So let me show you how that happens. Imagine that the average cost curve is above the demand curve, but the marginal cost curve is below. And imagine that a firm tries to charge a price here. Well, then its quantity would be here, and its average cost would be that. So then it would say, oh, average cost pricing. Let's charge a price over here. Well, but then the, uh, the quantity is lower, and so the average cost is higher. And so you see it collapses down to zero. Now, marginal cost can also be above average cost. Um, is Alex... Uh, Alex Z here? Oh. Um, could anyone describe how that can occur? Yeah, Connor. If you had advantageous selection. Well, so what, what, we're just talking about cost curves so far. Oh, okay. yeah. well, so but, it would just be upwards. Yeah, and, and so what, what problem would that cause? Um, that would cause the problem that as the market got bigger and bigger, like the people who would be the costliest would come in. Yeah, but, but what distortion does it cause? In, in the quantity that's produced. Then it will be underproduced. Overproduced, actually, right? Before it's underproduced, right? Under advantage, I mean, under increasing uh, costs, um, there's actually oversupply. So imagine that we have an increasing average cost curve and then a marginal cost curve that's increasing more quickly. Then marginal costs are greater than average costs. And if we have average cost pricing, we actually get too much production rather than too little. OK. So average cost pricing is therefore obviously not an ideal solution. But there's a natural question of whether it's better than an unregulated monopoly. Um, Orlando's not here. Uh, but does anyone else want to try to say whether they think an unregulated monopoly is better or worse than average cost pricing, or under what circumstances? Uh, Kevin, yeah. So if you're capping it at average cost pricing, yep. um, it will distort the quantity, but not as much as if you let the monopoly raise the price all the way up to um, that quantity's, you know, uh, what's that curve? Uh, marginal revenue. Yeah, marginal revenue curve. So yeah. in that sense, uh, average cost pricing like, still distorts, but it might be better. That's true if the problem is under provision, right? The way to see that is no monopolist will ever charge a price that's below his average cost. Otherwise, he's going to lose money, right? And so monopolists will always, if they're going to earn positive profits, charge a price that's above their average cost, right? Um, so let me show you a picture of that. So under, uh, under declining marginal <coughs> cost and declining average cost, the social optimum is here. Average cost pricing is up here, and the monopoly is all the way over there. However, um, when the marginal cost is greater than the average cost, uh, when there's increasing marginal cost, 
then it's not so obvious because the monopoly will lead to underproduction, but the uh, average cost pricing will lead to overproduction. And in that case, either one could be better than the other. Right? So in this case, when you have increasing marginal cost and average cost, the competitive equilibrium has too much quantity, the monopoly optimum has too little quantity, and the social optimum is in between the two of them. Okay. So, um, uh, so at least as important as the uh, these static distortions associated with um, m uh, monopoly are the longer term uh, incentive effects. So the reason is that companies can easily impact their costs through choices that they make. Um, by not making effort, for example, to cut costs or uh, unnecessary workers, um, not innovating to create production processes that are more uh, efficient, choosing uh, expensive inputs over cheap ones, and two years ago actually now, problem set looked at these issues quite a bit. Um, and unless the f all these decisions by the firm can be directly controlled by the regulator, if you're regulating firms down to average cost pricing, you're giving them no incentive to economize on their costs, basically. Because they're always going to earn a profit which is only, you know, capped. Right? Or they might have a little incentive because they want to increase the quantity, but that's very small relative to the benefit that they would get directly by just uh, earning, you know, greater profits on every unit that they sell. Right? In fact, it can be worse than this. So imagine that the regulator learns over time about the cost that the firm faces. Then the firm might actually want to increase its costs. Why is that? Because the future profits that it's allowed to earn might be based on what the regulator learns about its costs today. So my father told me a, a story about this, uh, that he was uh, working for a defense contractor for the federal government. And the defense, and the defense department, when he pitched, uh, a project, he pitched it that it would come in at only 50% of budget. And the you know, general in charge of the project said, I would be derelicting my duty to my country if this project didn't spend every last penny of its budget. And the question is why? Well, the, he realized that next year Congress wouldn't appropriate as much money if they, uh, if they didn't use up the full budget this year, right? And that problem happened a lot in the Soviet Union, where like you would base the budget for things on last year's estimate. And it happens a lot within corporations. I'm actually, uh, I actually work with some companies and I've talked to them about these uh, things and often people's sales quotas will be based on how much they sold last year. And you can see how, what perverse incentives that can create. Um, so, um, but average cost pricing can cause all of these problems even when it's not directly driven by regulation. So imagine that it's just that there's free entry in ind industry. Well then no one's going to want to innovate. Uh, people aren't really going to want to reduce their costs because they know that other people will imitate them if they do that and they won't actually get any benefits from that. And trying to address that issue will be the topic of lecture 12 which we'll have next Thursday. Okay, so one important source of nonlinear costs is selection. So selection occurs in markets where different consumers have different values to firms. So for example, consider the cost to the government of providing insurance coverage. And let's let Q be the fraction of the population that's covered by insurance, and let's let P be the prevailing price. Costs are then going to be nonlinear, not because of economies of scale or economies of scope directly, but because people differ in the risk of covering them, right? So we say that there's adverse selection into a market for, say, insurance, if the people who are most unhealthy are the people who are willing to buy insurance even at the highest prices. Um, and Vidur, what is, how do we represent adverse selection in terms of slopes of cost curves? So because the people who are riskiest are often in first, costs are much higher than the Exactly. So, um, 
the, the marginal and average cost curves slope down in this case because the people who come in, even when there are only a few people in the market, are the costliest people. And uh, later on, uh, people get less costly. We call it something advantageous selection if, for example, the people who are first into the market who are willing to pay the most are actually the least costly. Why might that happen in insurance? Well, imagine that the people who most want insurance are not the people who are sickest, but the people who are most hypochondriac, right? Those people probably both have a um, higher willingness to pay for insurance and are healthier, um, despite uh, the fact that they want insurance more. Um, so, Vidur, what, in what direction do cost curves slope in that case? It'd be upward because the first people are the low cost people. Exactly. Um, and um, this may be important if it's like uneducated or poor people who are not getting insurance because they don't realize how important it is to get insurance because educated people tend to be healthier as well. It's also possible that there's a mixture of these two things over different quantity ranges. And as a result, we can construct a cost curve for the industry as a whole. Now this isn't a cost curve for an individual insurer. For an individual insurer, they're basically going to get you know, the average people in their population if they try to lower their price or raise it. But for the industry as a whole, the costs are decreasing or increasing because as they increase the number of people in the market that are covered overall, they change the costs. Okay. So thus, selection can be viewed as measured by the slope of the cost curves. Um, and of course, the slope of the average cost curve on its own is enough because this gives, because we remember that the slope of the average cost curve is exactly equal uh, when divided by quantity to the gap between marginal and average costs. Uh, and this uh, gives the relevant wedge and this is what Einov et al. in their 2010 paper measured. So there was a large uh, aluminum manufacturer that um, had two plants um, Oh, sorry, offered two insurance plans. One insurance plan was very minimal. You can almost think of it as no insurance. It, it was a very minimal insurance plan. And the second one was fairly comprehensive. And different divisions of this firm uh, were allowed to choose their own, uh, man their managers were allowed to choose uh, their own prices. And they basically assume that these managers chose these prices for the two different plans in basically idiosyncratic ways that weren't correlated with anything else. So they thought of this as generating random variation in the prices people were charged, right? Now, is this really random? I don't know. I mean, you have to, that's, a, that's an empirical question. But imagine this were the case, then you would get random variation in the number of people who adopt the high plan versus the low plan, right? From this random variation in price. And then they can measure people's costs based on their claims because they can see all the claims that were submitted. They have all that data. And this draws out the average cur cost curve, which in turn implies the marginal cost curve. And the, dis the difference between these is the marginal distortion. And of course, the size of the total distortion depends on the demand curve. So let me just show you what they did. So um, here are different prices that you could have charged for the difference between these uh, two plans for moving from the low plan to the high plan. And here in the white circles are the number of people who adopted the high plan when the prices were different amounts. And as you see, you get a nice downward sloping demand curve that they drew a linear fit through. I probably would have drawn a concave uh, fit through them, but uh, that's what they did. And then they got the average costs of people when the prices were these different things. And as you see, there's a nice downward sloping uh, average cost curve. And then from that, they fit a linear curve, which gives you a marginal cost curve. And then you can just derive the Harberger triangle from that. OK. Uh, so what does this show? Well, there is some distortion. There is some adverse selection here. But it's pretty modest, and the distortion is pretty small. <coughs> And in fact, there's been lots of cases where people have found uh, indications of actually advantageous selection in these types of markets, um, which could lead to actually too much insurance. And this was a bit, bit of a letdown because there was a huge literature 
on adverse selection that was saying markets should collapse, all this terrible stuff should happen. Um, so uh, the question is, why didn't any of these studies uh, find adverse selection? And Franklin, can you think of a reason why that might be the case? The, yeah, so what might system, so all these studies, what types of markets did they look at? So in order to draw a graph like this, you need to have that there's actually quantities in the market, right? That there's like price, that things are non-trivial. What does that all imply? Does anyone have a thought? Uh, yeah, Donnie. Well, the market exists. Exactly. The market didn't collapse. If the market collapsed, all the quantities would be down here at zero and you couldn't measure anything. It's an adverse selection. Yeah. So if, if there's a lot of adverse selection, we expect markets to collapse. So it's sort of a bit strange to go and look at markets that exist and then say that there's not that much adverse selection. Yeah. But you could, but you could have that's true but but you certainly would expect that at least the strong cases of adverse selection would lead the market to collapse right is that you Oliver you you look completely different <laughs> I, I thought it was you because the face looked the same but um, okay um, so this uh, is exactly the problem that Nathan Hendren, in his job market paper, which is now forthcoming, uh, investigated. So, um, Atova, how did Nathan try to look at this? Uh, anybody else want to venture a guess? Uh, yeah, Arvid. So he, he essentially sampled, like, on the empirical side, he sampled three markets, and then he looked at how people believe their own probabilities of having private information. Mm -hmm. And then he, like I said, there's one market where there was just almost no, um, no market. Because yeah. people had a lot of private information about themselves. Exactly. And the less they had, the more they got in short. So the people in the sample were the people for which it wasn't that important. Exactly. So he showed that um, he looked at markets where you couldn't get insurance for any price and then tried to ask whether selection was the cause by looking at surveys and looked, looked at people's predictions of whether they would get sick or not and saw whether those did a good job predicting whether people actually got sick and used that as an indication of private information. So he basically took what they said in these surveys, looked at whether how that predicted them getting sick or not, constructed a notion of their private information, and then looked whether that private information was really dispersed in these markets, right? Um, and you can do this all with average versus marginal cost on the first unit of insurance that people get. Right? So you can look at if people just got a tiny bit of insurance, would there be very strong adverse selection into that tiny bit of insurance or not? And if it's very strong, if that wedge is very large, then you would say that it, the market should collapse. And so what he did is he looked at exactly the size of the wedge between average and marginal cost for a little bit of insurance in the market. And he found that in all the markets where people got rejected, couldn't get insurance at any price, there was um, a very large wedge predicted by his model, about 75% tax effectively on insurance. In all the markets where there was a market, he found that it was below 50%. And so he concluded from that that it was plausible that the cause of these markets <coughs> collapsing was adverse selection, and that the problem with all the previous studies had been that they'd only been looking at markets that existed. Yeah, Kevin. Uh, can you explain again like, why the first unit of insurance makes the difference? So the reason is that, like, okay, you could have, there's selection between lots of different types of plans. Here we just considered two exogenous plans, right? Now, the first unit of insurance is the one that, like, we could offer people lots of different amounts of insurance, right? And there could be different amounts of adverse selection depending on how much insurance we offer to people. Sure. But if there's going to be such severe adverse selection even on the first unit of insurance, then you're never going to start offering insurance in the first place. Oh, so like yeah, that's sort of the idea. 
Okay, so here's what he found. He estimated the spread of people's private information. Here's what it looked like in the life insurance market where people were able to buy life insurance. And here's what it looked like in the life insurance markets, like the sub parts of the population where people weren't able to buy insurance. And what I mean is that like based on certain conditions, you might be put into a risk pool where you're not allowed to buy insurance at any price. And in other parts of the population, you might be put into a risk pool where you are allowed to buy insurance. And in the areas where you were allowed to buy insurance, it looked like this. In the areas where you weren't allowed to buy insurance, it was really spread out. Yeah, Lancelot. What kind of data did he have? So he had a survey at time zero where people say whether they are high risk or low risk. And they say, what do you think the chance of you dying in the next so many years is? But then he was like able to actually follow them for the, the next like, 10 years? Yeah. For 20 years or something like that. Yeah. Um, now the interesting thing is that he found that um, there was really extreme selection in these things, but in other markets there just wasn't, people weren't that good at predicting what would happen to them. And therefore uh, you had much less adverse selection and those were the markets that existed. Oh uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I don't remember if he said that he experienced that in this paper. And if so, what yeah, he did. did. Yeah, so he, what he did is he basically put, set up a parametric model where people, like, um, you know, either report, like, the truth plus noise, or they report the truth plus noise rounded to the nearest thing. And then he, you know, tried to use that as a way to back out people's information. Okay. So the same types of approach, approaches that were used to regulate, that we talked about for regulating markets, uh, just standard, um, uh, standard uh, natural monopolies can be used here, and they have the same issues. So for example, subsidies for insurance. Uh, Kevin, how might that uh, so help solve this problem, and what problems might it itself cause? Um. So it would help. So subsidies for insurance might cover more of the people that like would be socially helpful, but the yeah. problem might be that you're overdoing it and that you don't want to like I don't know, there might be people who don't want insure well, I don't know. But you could have people you don't want to insure at all. Yeah, so um, this is a widely advocated policy solution and in fact it's what happens under Obamacare, but it requires you know the cost function, right? And that cost function might say that there's some people who shouldn't be insured. In fact, that's what this cost function over here showed, right? This demand curve and cost curve do not cross all the way over here, right? They cross here at 80% of people being covered, but not more than that. And the reason is that there can be moral hazard from insurance, right? Um, and so there might be people from the moral hazard problem is larger than the benefit of the insurance. And so it's not worth covering those people, right? Uh, or it might have administrative costs. Yeah, when Oliver. When you say subsidies for insurance, do you mean like, like uniform subsidies or subsidies to function of people's risk? Well, I, I was just saying uniform subsidies at the moment. Yeah. Um, how about mandates for universal coverage? Uh, Zafeng, uh, when are those good and when might those be problematic? This is good that uh, it can cover like more people. Yeah. But it's bad for like if you are very healthy, it's not efficient for you to buy the health insurance, for example. But uh, if if uh, if the government mandates everyone to buy insurance, that will it will not be. Efficient. It's not obvious that it's not efficient for a healthy person to buy insurance because the healthy person uh, obviously will be a cheap person to insure. But it could still be that the net value of them getting insurance is high. But the question is, is higher than zero at least. But the question is how does like their risk and the insurance that they get compare to the moral hazard that that insurance creates? So a young person who has an opportunity if they get insurance to buy a bunch of like uh, plastic surgery that the insurer will cover, that would probably be not, not be an efficient insurance to have. But on the other hand, like a young person who uh, has very little moral hazard, you know, 
who basically just gets covered for catastrophic things that are totally out of his control, that would be beneficial. On the other hand, a very sick person who's sick with, I don't know, something that's quite under their control, like they're, they're obese or something like that, then that actually might be a bad person to insure because absent insurance, they might actually reduce uh, th that activity, uh, whereas with insurance, you see what I mean? So it all yeah. depends on the relative size of moral hazard and uh, the insurance value, right? And so this could easily go too far, at least in principle. Um, how about, did, yeah, so yeah, go um, ahead, Lancelot. In that study, did you have like, also like, information about whether people think they're going to lose their jobs? Or, uh, He's doing that in a different study, actually, right now. But you could think right of a, an unemployment insurance as a, as a market that doesn't exist in the private sector because there is too much adverse relation. Yeah, that's exactly what he's working on right now. Um, he's trying to figure out whether that's the case. Um, so another possibility is discriminating on prices based on people's costs. Uh, Luke, Jane, what, what are some of... How could that help address this problem, and what are some of the potential disadvantages of that? Uh, so I think like everybody has a different condition, is what you're saying. Yeah, imagine that you you know you can charge people based on their genetics, their conditions, et cetera, et cetera. So, so don't you just have like a market for lemons where people who opt in have like a adverse like condition? But you can solve that by charging them based on their conditions, right? Right. So that's another way you could try to address this problem, right? Um, and uh, if you could personalize people's prices, this would uh, resolve a lot of the adverse selection problems, but it's both politically explosive and it can add risks to people when they have to change insurers. If you don't have one insurer for your whole life, then if you, imagine you only have a insurer for one year, then when you change insurers, you're going to have to pay a higher price if you've gotten sick that year. And that undermines the whole value of insurance. The whole point of insurance is that you don't have to pay more when you get sick, right? Yeah, Kevin. So is that kind of the idea when like car insurance companies charge you more when you get to like get speeding tickets or something? Uh, yeah, exactly. They're trying to account for your risk. Yeah, totally. Sorry, I don't know how to add risk from changing. Okay, so imagine that um, you uh, had insurance every year and you change insurers every year and they can change you based on whatever conditions you get. Imagine that on December 15th you get cancer. Now suddenly you have to pay for the whole value associated with you having cancer. Shouldn't the, would the old insurance company do that as well? No. They, they would cover you. I mean, that's the whole point of insurance, <coughs> is that you don't have to pay if you get yeah, sick. Yeah, for the next year, right? Would they they can charge you higher? Yeah, no, no, it could, but, 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 but if you could char sign a long-term contract for insurance, oh, right? That kind of cuts down a lot of the price information that you could Yeah, exactly. Price. Well, not, I mean, I guess to some extent, but if, if there's like ex ante stuff that's known about you, then they could, like your genetics, they could price discriminate based on that. But more generally, like there's a big trade off between like insurance against health risk and these, uh, you know, these charging based on your conditions. Because if they can charge based on your conditions, you've sort of lost a lot of the value of the insurance in the first place. I mean, I mean, like, isn't that a more efficient thing to do, like, total every year, right? Like, you know, well, I mean, it loses all the value for the, from the insurance, right? I mean, there's like, like, imagine that, like, you bought insurance for just today, and then, like, tomorrow they could charge you a new price for insurance for the next day. You might as well not have insurance at all. Um, no, because like, you're mostly you're covered by like everyone else. I mean, not everyone gets cancer, right? So. I mean, I, no, but I mean, insure, the whole point of insurance is not to cover like you going to the doctor. I mean, that's fine. The main yeah. point of insurance is to cover bad things that could happen to you. Right, right. They're not going to charge you costs. They're just going to charge you a higher premium. Yeah, but the premium that they're going to charge you the, is going to be equal longer. to your. I mean, if you're allowed to charge based on every condition, then the premium they'll charge you will be equal to the actuarially fair thing for people in your condition. So maybe that's more efficient. I mean, it's, I don't know what you mean by efficient, but it undermines the whole value of insurance. I mean, there's no point of having insurance if it's not actually going to reduce the amount you have to pay if you get sick. Insurance is all about subsidizing each other's risks. Exactly. I mean, that's, that's all that insurance is. No, I know that. I'm just... Like, ima imagine that, like, you bought fire insurance, 
And then like, you know, the minute that your house started burning down, someone came to you and said, oh, now you have to buy a new policy and you have to pay the amount that's actuarially fair given. And like the thing is that, you know, that, that would defeat the whole point of having fire insurance. Actuarial, actuarially fair. What? I mean, like not, it wouldn't be any different when they initially assess your, like. It would be, individual. because as soon as we know that your house is burning down, then, yeah, then as a healthy individual, and like when they only give us a certain of premium based on like health, well, like well visits, and like yeah, that whatever you know, cavity fillings, and like that, that's not actually actual. I can't say it. That's not fair. That is, that's not that's not cost. That's still lower than okay. Not necessarily. I mean, it's it's average given the observables that you have. Average of the whole pool, not just the of the whole pool of people who are like you, and what that pool is depends on what you're allowed to charge price on. But also people will pay higher premiums because they're like at risk even if they don't as in the whole thing we're all subsidizing each other's insurance. Well but it all depends on what you can price on. No, it doesn't though. That's what I'm maybe I'm forgetting it. I can look you, you have you have to price I mean okay. We could either have price where everyone pays the same price, right? Or we can price based on your conditions. And if we price based on pre existing conditions, then people face a huge reclassification risk. That if they get sick then they're going to have to suddenly pay a lot more, right? And that's hap that happened to people all the time in the individual insurance markets. And that's the whole thing Obamacare was really trying to address. Well, yeah, what's the market failure that stops people from writing long-term insurance contracts then? That's not clear to me. Why, why do we write annual insurance contracts rather than 20 years? I mean, I think that there's like legal issues that like you, you can't, I mean, you could pay for it up front, but most people don't have the liquidity to pay for it up front. But, uh, and, you know, I, I think that there are some major legal impediments to that uh, thing. There's issues about whether you think your insurer will be around for that long. Uh, and also, you could say that people relying on government intervention might, you know, so there, there, there's a lot of potential explanations. John Cochran <laughs> thinks it's all government intervention that stops that from happening. I'm skeptic, more skeptical of that, but yeah, Kevin. Could you also say that longer term plans carry more of like a Well, but that's that's always the trade-off with insurance, right? The more insurance we provide, the the more the less moral ha more moral hazard there is. So, yeah. Um, okay. So all of these issues come up in other selection contexts as well. Um, so in the market for like murky assets during the financial crisis, uh, you know, people talked about bringing in TARP to subsidize the purchase of these assets, but of course that creates problems because you might end up buying too many of these assets and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in the markets for consumer lending and credit cards, mortgages, there's big issues of selection. In markets for skilled workers, uh, people are of different skills, right? <coughs> and while, um, uh, while these issues, uh, these issues of selection are a really important issue in health insurance, there's other important uh, market failures that interact with these in interesting ways. So for example, a lot of, there's an argument that consumers can be irrationally loyal to a particular brand, maybe one that they've been buying for a long time. Uh, so Ben Handel showed that people often stick with an insurer that they've, um, that they've had uh, in the past for the future, even if that insurer is not the optimal one for them. So he showed that there are people who are buying plans where no matter what happened to them, they were going to lose $1,000 relative to the plan that, uh, that they had an opportunity to adopt, but it was too complicated for them to figure out that, that because it was like all these different copays and a million different things, and so people ended up in the wrong plans. But that can actually be a good thing from a selection perspective. Why is that? Because if the least healthy people, the least educated often people, are like the most confused, then they're least likely to switch into the policies that are uh, most advantageous to them, and that can stop the selection problems, which might otherwise cause the market to collapse. So Ben actually argued that in that case, helping people figure out what plan is best for them could actually be bad for the market. People wonder why people don't like economics. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, actually, the interesting thing is Ben, despite that, is doing exactly what he thinks is bad for the market and working with a company to help people figure out what plans are best for them. 
to help them game the system effectively. Um, you mean like the information problem when you say game the system? Well, yeah, I mean, it, it all depends on how you look at it. I mean, uh, so other issues are about short and long run insurance, which we were just talking about a bunch. There's also questions about lack of competition. You could argue that um, lack of competition could actually solve some of these problems. Uh, Connor, uh, why, why might lack of competition actually interact in a positive way? with some of these distortions. Well, if it was being like oversupplied, then yeah. they would be able to charge like higher prices and then it would reduce it. Yeah, so in some cases, uh, these other distortions, you have to really think about how they interact with the selection distortion, not just think about the selection distortion on its own. Okay, uh, another reason that it could help is long-term insurance. So imagine that there's like only one insurer, right? And that insurer is, um, you know, forced to uh, cover people, then there's much less risk of you leaving to another insurer, and that insurer might have an incentive then to invest in preventative care for you in order to reduce your cost for the future, whereas an insurer who was only gonna have you for one year wouldn't have an incentive to invest in preventative care. Okay, so I, I think selection gives an interesting language for thinking about the U.S. healthcare debate, which is obviously uh, still, despite the fact that these slides were written three years ago, constantly in the news. Uh, so Obamacare had two components. One was non-discrimination based on pre-existing conditions, and the second was an individual mandate for everyone to purchase insurance. And the logic of the death spiral slash selection justifies why these two things go together. So um, Connie? Why uh, is, would it be problematic to have non-discrimination if you didn't have an individual mandate? Because everyone has very severe health problems. Exactly. So you would get a very severe adverse selection because you would be pooling together people with all these different risks and leading to lots of things that could uh, potentially destroy the market. What would be the problem uh, with having um, with having a mandate uh, without forcing non-discrimination. Is Matt here? S somebody else want to describe that? Ah, uh, yes, yeah, same. Oh, so, <coughs> so if you're, uh, if you're a sick person and you have to buy insurance, yeah. you're forced to buy it. Because there's no non-discrimination, you have to pay a lot of Yeah, so people... Yeah, people couldn't afford to do it, probably, right? And people would be going bankrupt, and that, that would also totally mess up the system, right? So the question then, uh, Lancelot, is why would you institute these pair of policies? What failure that we've been talking about could these pair of policies address? Well, adverse solution? Yeah. I mean, we'll <laughs> no, but 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 the but what are the I mean, w so we said that you know, putting in the individual mandate addresses the adverse selection problem, given that you're doing non-discrimination. But why would you put in this package together? What what problem existing in the market does it does it help address? Uh, sometimes uh, I think it might be more efficient to put over more uh, more different like you diversify the risk more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, that's a point, but I think the biggest point is probably that um, it helps provide long-term insurance against the reclassification risk that doesn't exist right now for people that are outside the market, right? Um, another reason is that individuals use health care anyway, even if they don't pay for it. If they get sick, they can go to the hospital and the hospital has to take care of them. And so this might be a better way of providing them with the insurance that they're effectively getting anyway. Um, rather than having it all just fall on top of the uh, hospital that happens to receive them. Yeah, Tova. Who funds like, the, the hospital, hospital provided insurance? Like the hospital? The hospitals have to fund it themselves. And they just have to raise prices on everybody else to do that. There's no government? Basically, no. So they have to, they have to treat all the people we, even though they get paid? Yeah. Do they? Yeah. yeah. Well, this is for you can go to jail if you don't do it. So yeah. Uh, this is for every treatment or just emergency? Oh, emergency. Okay. 
you can close your drama center. Yeah. 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 There's yeah. an argument that, that people without uh, health insurance might like wait for a long time before like like they have like something that you yeah exactly they have so they won't they won't do preventative care and that could actually increase the cost of the system overall absolutely well Jack what are some of the reasons why you might not want to implement these policies well, I mean, as, as we discussed, there could be, if, if there are a lot of administrative costs, you know, there could be inefficient provision. Yeah. Provision. Maybe, maybe not everybody yeah. needs health care on an efficiency basis. Um, we can also cover too many frivolous things, depending on the politics of the issue. Yeah. Consumer groups have more power, lobbying for different types of coverage. You know, as far yeah. As it also, yeah, it might also, um, like if there's moral hazard, it might, you know, cause too much moral hazard. Yeah. Uh, it could also, I mean, another thing in the way that Obamacare was implemented that would, that can be quite problematic is that there are like, because the poor are least likely to be able to afford, they get the most subsidy. And so that is a discouragement to work. So that it's sort of like an increase in tax rates effectively. Yeah, that's a lot. So there was also like, I think in one of the readings, the fact that when you pull people without discriminating, yeah. Could be either bad or good depending on like what kind of risk and we used to pay people in. So that would be like both reasons. Right? Yeah, I mean, um, if you force everyone into the market, that's not going to be the bi big problem. But there are still problems when you force everyone into the market, which is you could get inefficiently too much okay. care provided. Yeah, Tova. I, I don't see like why is this better than like a fully government implemented healthcare system? Not necessarily. I mean, I, I don't think that even Obama thinks that that's really true. It's just you, like preserving the superficial feeling of it being private was important to placate certain people who don't like the notion of a socialized healthcare system. I mean, I guess people could argue that there's some kind of competition that will still go on under this. I, I'm not sure that's really plausible. I'm not sure what they can compete on. But it's not like insurers are providing you service. All they're doing is providing a financial service to you. So, I mean, you know. but they do provide service. At least that's how they like, market themselves. Yeah, so I mean, but, th but then it's not clear that that's even a good thing because, like, what competing in service could mean is that they end up covering too many frivolous things. You know what I mean? It's not obvious that competition along that dimension is a particularly good thing. Y yeah, Jack? Or in the other direction, on yeah. that channel, couldn't we see competition on, on, like, on timing of there is some kind of quality covert price competition in that you know if I'm healthy and don't expect to file a lot of claims, I'm gonna go with like the Ryanair of health insurance. Yeah. Basically if someone gets sick, you know, they'll pay you legally, but it's gonna take a lot of cash the castle. Yeah. Whereas that, you know, so I can pay lower price insurance as opposed to someone who expects to have more claims and needs better service in their country. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think there's a lot of hokey stuff in this thing where like, you know, no one's actually talking about what we're allowing these people to compete on or why we're allowing them to compete on it. We just want to say that it's private. And then, like, you know, either it makes no difference at all or it ends up being stuff like what you're talking about. Which there are mandates as far as, like, administrative costs, too, right? They, they have to spend a certain amount of revenues on paying on other services. Yeah, so that's a really weird thing. So, I mean, if, if, if you think about these mandates on reducing... This is the thing I find really funny. You always hear people first bitching about um, like how there's too much bureaucracy and too much waste on administrative costs, and then you hear them bitching about waste, fraud, and abuse. And like, yeah, the point of bureaucracy is to reduce waste, fraud, and abuse. Like, you can't both reduce waste, fraud, and abuse and reduce it, you know, bureaucratic overhead. That's the whole point of bureaucratic overhead. That's the whole point of red tape and all these forms is to reduce that stuff. Like, you, you know, maybe we're not doing the optimum in one direction or the other, but it's not like, it's just a fundamental information problem. You can't just like bitch about both of those things. It's like saying, you know, I don't like construction work, but I don't like there being potholes in the road. You know what I mean? Yes, that's true. But there's no way to deal with the potholes in the road without doing construction work. Would so. the Ryanair 